Welcome back to Campus Party 2013 on the Galileo stage. Next up, we have Jose Pons introducing the Hyper Exoskeleton. Round of applause, please, for Jose Pons. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, today we'll be talking about this uh, technology for rehabilitation. We call it uh, H1. It is the result of, uh, of a Spanish research project that is called Hyper. So uh, just a few words to introduce ourselves. We are coming from a uh, uh, bioengineering group here, uh, which is part of the Spanish Research Council, which is a large research organization in Spain. So uh, I will be presenting the, the exon. Magda Bortole, that is with me here, will demonstrate the exoskeleton at the end of my presentation. So um, this will be the outlook of the presentation. So basically, I will be talking about the, motiva the motivation and the field of uh, application of these uh, technologies, which, as I said before, is rehabilitation. And then I will uh, go through the different uh, exoskeletal uh, robotic structures that we have developed at the SIG. So uh, our motivation is based on the, on the number of uh, neurolog neurological conditions that are leading to severe motor disorders. So there is a number of uh, these neurological conditions, like for instance, uh, uh, strokes, sorry. Like for instance, stroke, that is leading to, uh, to severe motor disorders or cerebral palsy or tremors, pathological tremors or spinal cord injury uh, uh, disorders. So you have here just a few uh, examples of, this, uh, of these conditions. What you see here is a stroke patient that is uh, walking uh, and you can see clearly the pathological uh, pattern uh, that he's developing while, while walking. In the second video here, what you have is, uh, is a child that is also walking. He's uh, suffering from uh, cerebral palsy, which is a disorder uh, of the brain. And you can see that he also, she also developed this pathological condition. Finally, what we have uh, here is, uh, is a patient with uh, essential tremor. Is also, which is also a neurological condition, and is leading to a motor disorder, a trembling motor disorder of the upper limbs. And you can see he's trying to just pour some water in, in a glass, and you can see that he's uh, spilling all, all, all this water because of the, of the condition. So all these uh, conditions here are disabling. So the idea is to try to develop, te develop technologies that can be used to uh, rehabilitate all these conditions. So. Um, all these conditions are, in addition, they are closely related to aging. So uh, it is expected that as the aging, popul uh, uh, the aging population uh, increases, uh, we will have uh, additional uh, cases of these neurological conditions. So uh, again, this is uh, an example of, uh, of a stroke patient that is uh, trying to uh, complete a number of uh, upper limb uh, motions. Uh, you can see that he has uh, problems, for instance, to raise the, the elbow, or he's, in this particular uh, case, he's trying to reach this point here, and you can see that he has uh, a disability there. So what is done currently uh, with these people is to apply manual therapy. Basically, what, did, what uh, physiotherapists and occupational therapists do is uh, try to retrain these people to uh, uh, perform the different motions that are uh, handicapped. Okay, in this particular case, uh, the physiotherapist is trying to help this guy to relearn grasping operations and uh, reaching and, uh, and uh, grasping operations. So uh, the idea is uh, trying to have uh, what we call robot-assisted uh, therapy, in which we use robots to help humans in this uh, uh, therapy. And this is just an example of a well-known uh, exoskeleton. This is the Lokomat exoskeleton. It is uh, manufactured and commercialized by the Swiss company that is called Hokoma. And basically, the uh, exoskeleton is applying this physical therapy uh, intensively uh, to uh, regain uh, uh, walking function. Okay, so uh, in the project that I was referring to before, we are uh, targeting uh, the three different stages 
in the evolution of these neurological conditions. So we are targeting phase one, which is uh, this, the, the so-called acute phase of the, of the neurological conditions, and phase two, where we have uh, rehabilitation, but we are also targeting phase three, which is the chronic phase of the, of the condition, where uh, rehabilitation is no longer uh, achieved, but we can use the technology for functional compensation. So uh, this is just an example of uh, this technology being used in any of these two phases here. So basically we have the, the technology that is helping this, uh, this uh, spinal cord injury uh, patient to walk and to train, walking again after the, after the, the, the lesion. And then we have, uh, for instance, uh, a similar technology here, which is used in the chronic phase of the, of the condition. So there is no possibility of uh, rehabilitation at this stage here, but we can still use the, the technology to uh, help these guys and to, and to have a functional compensation. So basically, uh, in this project that I was mentioning before, we, we are combining different technologies. Uh, uh, now robots is what uh, you saw uh, before, these technologies here. And then motor neural processes is a uh, functional electrical stimulation of the, of the muscles of the different limbs of the patients. So we use these technologies in combination in the three clinical phases, acute, subacute, and chronic. And the aim of the intervention is in these two phases, uh, rehabilitation, and in this phase here, just a motor substitution of, or uh, compensation. Okay? So uh, I was referring to two different uh, technologies, uh, neurorobots and uh, motor neural processes. This is uh, just a typical example of a neurorobot. It is the system that we will be demonstrating later on. Uh, we have also uh, developed uh, neural processes, which is a system that uh, stimulates uh, muscles. So you have here three different uh, very well-known examples of, uh, of, a of a neural processes. This is a cochlear implant. So basically, we have a, a microphone here. This is getting information on the on the sound in the in the environment, and then we have an inter, uh, 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 stimulation system that is stimulating the auditory nerve of a, of a person. This is a pacemaker, and this is a deep brain stimulation system for suppressing uh, pathological tremors. So uh, these are three examples of uh, neural processes. What we are referring to when we uh, uh, talk about uh, motor neural processes is this uh, example here where we have external electrodes uh, for stimulating muscles of the musculoskeletal system and uh, in a similar way uh, when we use uh, an exoskeleton we are able with these technologies to uh, move the limbs of the, of, the, of the patients or the healthy person. So uh, if uh, this is a scheme of what we are targeting with this project. So basically, what we have here at the central part of this scheme is uh, the schematic representation of one of these conditions. So we have uh, functional parts of the body, for instance, the brain. We have a lesion here, and then we have paralyzed or paratic parts of the body. So the idea is that we use either a neural robot or a motor neural processes or a combination of both of them uh, to uh, uh, to help restore function. So we get information on what is the intention of the user, the, the patient, uh, and then we use uh, either electrical stimulation, in this case here, or forces applied by the uh, robotic exoskeletons, in this case here, to move uh, the limbs to help the patient to restore function and to uh, ideally to get uh, uh, to, re to rehabilitate function. Yeah, if, it, if this is not possible, then to substitute uh, function. So, uh, just a few words on the background of uh, of uh, this approach. So, why we use uh, an exoskeleton or a functional electrical stimulation system to restore function? So, basically, when we uh, healthy healthy humans perform a function. We plan it at the level of the, of the brain, and then uh, we implement it, and, uh, and this results in us uh, walking or grasping something or, or whatever. What happens with, uh, with one of these uh, conditions is that you uh, can plan the movement, but there is a lesion that uh, in, in a way is uh, 
stopping the transmission of neural activity to the different uh, muscles that are involved in the in the function. So uh, this information cannot reach, cannot reach uh, properly the muscles, and this function is not performed. And uh, as a consequence of this, uh, there is no feedback. There is no sensation coming back to the brain. So what we want to do with uh, with these technologies is to identify with, for instance. Uh, uh, BCI technologies, EEG technologies, which is the intention of the of the user. For instance, moving this uh, ankle here, and then we use a function electrical stimulation or the or the exoskeleton that I was referring to before to move the ankle that cannot be moved uh, by the patient. So in this way, we train the move uh, the movement, and we also provide feedback to the to the uh, to the patient. And the idea is that this, if it is repeated. Uh, will, read, uh, will lead to a, to a, um, a retraining of, uh, of the motion. So we have to be careful to get information, the right information on the user intention to move. And we have to be also careful to synchronize the feedback that we are providing with the exoskeleton or with a functional electrical st uh, uh, stimulation system uh, to the different limbs of the of the muscle, because the other, uh, b because if this information is not synchronized, uh, then there will not be an association between the plant activity and the feedback that we are getting, and there will be no uh, training. So, uh, in order to be able to do this, we can uh, uh, source source our information from different levels of the uh, of the uh, human. Uh, uh, neuromusculoskeletal system. So, for instance, we can look at uh, brain uh, patterns in the brain activity uh, and, to, uh, and uh, we can try to use these patterns in the brain activity to, uh, to drive our exoskeleton, for instance. So, uh, what you have here is the, the, the brain activity at different frequencies uh, along, the, along the gate cycle for a healthy uh, uh, individual and you see that there is a, uh, a very clear uh, cyclic activity in the in the brain uh, in the brain uh, rhythms. This is the the case of a stroke patient. You see that uh, all this activity has disappeared. So the idea is that we can, uh, uh, through the rehabilitation process, bring this br this brain here to a similar situation that we have here. And this is. Uh, what, happen in a, what happens in a, in a stroke patient after, after just one month of uh, training with uh, this or other technologies, you, you see that uh, some rhythmic activity is starting to develop at the brain level after, after training. So we can source our information at the brain level to, to drive our systems, but we can also source uh, the information at the spinal cord level or at the muscular, uh, or, or at the muscular level. So uh, what we have here is, uh, is an explanation on how we can do this. So uh, basically, in a few words, uh, in, a nut in a nutshell, we plan our activities at the brain level. We coordinate the activities uh, at least for the lower limbs at the spinal cord uh, level. And then we implement the, the, the functions, the activities with, the mu with our muscles. So uh, in, uh, for the particular case of walking, the spinal cord is coordinating uh, the, the, the neural drive that is coming from the brain, coordinating this neural drive and, and directing, uh, directing it to the different muscles in a coordinated way. So, and this is done uh, by uh, what is called uh, synergy. So basically, these are the neural commands that are coming from the brain. And this is the role of, uh, of the spinal cord. It is giving different weights to the different, uh, for the corresponding to the different muscles. So uh, let's say by the uh, multiplication of, uh, of uh, these neural drives uh, by the muscles, the, the, the muscle weights, then we have different uh, EMG, different activity driving the muscles. So uh, we can also source information for driving uh, these technologies uh, from this, uh, from this uh, information. So uh, this is just an example for, for you to, to see how uh, this can be uh, illustrative of what is happening in, in a particular patient. So these are the different ways for a healthy control for a healthy person. So uh, the, the spinal cord injury is uh, coordinating uh, neural drive according to these weights. So each weight corresponds to a muscle. These are the different muscles that are involved in walking. This is for healthy controls. This is for a stroke patient in the affected and unaffected side. 
so uh, what we what I'm highlighting here in red is a difference, a clear difference in the in these patterns from healthy to uh, stroke patients in both affected and unaffected side. You see that uh, here weights are much higher for these two muscles than here, or that uh, we have a much more uh, muscle activity here than in here. So uh, this is a particular pathological condition that leads to the mo movement disorder that you saw in the videos at the, at the very beginning. So we can use this information because we have uh, uh, this for healthy users. We can measure this for a particular stroke patient. So if we have the, the, the information for the healthy control, we have the information for the particular uh, patient, then we can compute the difference and then we can, we can uh, target uh, uh, a restoration of this, uh, of this coordination of movements by means of, uh, of the uh, rhodized uh, therapy. This is just an example for you to see how we can do this. Uh, this is uh, the exoskeleton that, we, you will see, uh, that you will see in, in a minute. Uh, this is uh, the ankle part of the exoskeleton in a clinical setting. So basically what we are trying to do is to um, um, uh, restore the coordination that, uh, that uh, this stroke patient has lost uh, due to the stroke at the spinal level. So basically what we are doing is uh, we are instrumenting uh, the patient with uh, sensors that will provide us uh, information on the muscle activity. From those sensors, we are getting uh, information on the coordination at the spinal level, and we are giving a feedback to the user uh, according to whether he's uh, performing in the right direction to restore the coordination at, at the spinal level. So, uh, and basically, we are just giving this feedback together with uh, passive motion of, uh, of the ankle. And you will see uh, how this is done. So basically, we are just Possibly moving the the ankle, at the same time we are recording EMG activity here. We are computing those weights that I was showing before. We are uh, looking at whether this uh, therapy is leading towards the healthy situation for the coordination of the, sp the spinal cord level, and we are just giving him on the screen information on whether he's uh, going in the right direction. And uh, uh, this has been already done for a number of stroke patients and uh, the uh, functional gain has been already clinically demonstrated with, uh, with, this, uh, with the system. So this was just uh, a few words on the, on the background for, for the application of these exoskeletal uh, systems. I will go now to, uh, to describe uh, the system that you will be uh, uh, that you will see in a minute. So uh, again, we are in the field of gait rehabilitation. There have been uh, several uh, prototypes in the in the literature, and in the some of them are already commercial. This is the well-known rewalk system that was uh, developed uh, by uh, by Israeli uh, company for spinal cord injury uh, patients. This is the Hokoma system that you will saw uh, that, that that you saw before in the in the video, and these are different types of exoskeletal structures that uh, are being developed in the in different groups around the world. So um, we have uh, collected all the background information in a number, in a number of publications. But uh, what I wanted to highlight here is that uh, our sources, our source of inspiration for building the system that you will see in a minute is uh, nature. So uh, the idea is that we try to exploit biomimetics and bioinspiration to develop the technologies that we integrate in our, in our system. So for instance, when we come to the sensory part of, uh, of the exoskeleton that you will see, uh, it is basically uh, built uh, and based on three uh, types of sensors. We have uh, force sensors, which measure the, the interaction force between the exoskeleton and the limbs. And then we have uh, um, position sensors for the different joints and velocity sensors for the, for the different joints. And the selection of these particular sensors is not... Uh, it, it is based on, on our observation of, uh, the, of the different sensors that we integrate in our muscles to, to be able to control our limbs. So basically, in our muscles, we have a Golgi 
tendon organs which measure the force at the tendons, the, the insertion points of the muscles to the, to the, to the bones. Uh, so this is equi equivalent to the, for, uh, for, to the force sensors that we have in, uh, in our exoskeleton. And then we have um, uh, wha what we call uh, nerve endings uh, integrated in the muscles, which are giving information on, uh, on um, uh, elongation, st uh, um, uh, stretch of the muscle, and velocity of, uh, of elongation. So these are the sensors that we are using because these are enough uh, for, 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 uh, to be able to control the system. So uh, we integrated uh, strain gauges in the structure of the exoskeleton, and we integrated uh, poten potentiometer and hole sensors at the, at, the, at the level of the actuators in order to be able to, uh, to control the system. When it comes to the, to the uh, kinematic structure of the exoskeleton, um, most, of the SS, most of the examples that I was showing before in the, uh, in the, in the previous slide uh, use monocentric uh, joints. That means that uh, what we have uh, in, in, our, in, in, in the different exoskeleton is a hinge with a, with a fixed uh, 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 rotation axis. So when we see w what happens with the, with the real anatomy, and this is an example of the ankle, of our ankle, we see that we have uh, uh, an instantaneous axis of rotation that is moving uh, according to the flexing angle of the, of the knee. So, uh, and this is uh, the projection of the different uh, axis of rotations on a, on a lateral plan plane here which describes this curve here. What happens if I uh, get an exoskeleton with a monocentric joint and place it over here? So basically, I'm forcing the, uh, the anatomy of, uh, of my knee. I'm not allowing it to move uh, according to, the, to, the, to their capabilities. So uh, in our system, what we do is we developed uh, what we call a four bar mechanism, which is something equivalent, uh, is basically uh, based on the cruciate ligament structure of the knee, which replicates this curve here at the level of the, of the, of the plane where we place the, the exoskeleton. So what is the result of this? That uh, the result is that we have a consistent and, and, uh, and compatible kinematics at the level of the exoskeleton, at the level of the, of the uh, human anatomy. Okay. Let's go to another example. So um, if you uh, uh, monitor the activity of a healthy uh, human while walking, and you f uh, focus on the knee, and you uh, measure the angle of the knee along the gait cycle, and measure the torque that you are applying to be able to walk, what you have, if you uh, plot one, one against the other, is a curve like this one here. So uh, for those of you who have a uh, background on mechanics, uh, you know that when you have a, a linear relation between a force and a displacement or, be, or between a torque and an angle, what you have is a spring. And this is exactly what you have in this particular range here. So what this means? This means that uh, during the stance phase of our gait cycle, our muscles are behaving as a spring. So this is very useful because this can save a lot of energy. So uh, because we can uh, uh, be able to... Uh, uh, to work with the exoskeleton by just putting a spring instead of a motor. And this is something that we did in the past. This, the, the prototype that you will see uh, today, it is with motors, but uh, this is something that we used in the past to be able to have autonomous systems to able to be uh, operated during, uh, during the whole day without uh, batteries. Okay? I will just skip this. Uh, Another thing that is very important uh, for this technology, especially when you, when you plan to apply it for uh, helping people to walk in the, on the street, is uh, efficiency while, while, while walking. Okay? So you have, been, uh, you have seen in TV uh, that uh, most of these exoskeletons will come with a, with a battery pack, this size here. Uh, and this is because uh, the, all the technologies that we are integrating in our system are not uh, efficient enough. Okay, so uh, 
what we want to do is to have efficient gates. So uh, and what you have here is just a very simple machine without any energy input that is able to work in a very natural uh, uh, pattern. So we wanted to to get uh, uh, to profit uh, from this uh, from this type of machines. So uh, before going to uh, developing this uh, this sort of systems, we uh, upgraded this to a more complex system like the one that you have here, where we have basically the same uh, way of operation that we have here, but in a more complex biped. Uh, uh, in which we were able to demonstrate that we can have efficient uh, gate uh, by by uh, by um, taking this uh, this uh, this energy principles into a more complex system. And once we have uh, uh, demonstrated this with bipeds, then we move to uh, the integration of these technologies uh, into. Uh, robotic exoskeletons to be able to uh, to uh, to be used as a, as a system for functional substitution, and this is the particular case of a previous project that we had, where we were targeting uh, patients with uh, unilateral uh, uh, lower limb uh, uh, disorders. Uh, in particular, this is this has uh, this uh, patient here had a post polio syndrome. So he is not able to, with, to, to, to stand or to walk without assistance because uh, he would collapse because he, there is no uh, enough force at the, at the muscle level. So uh, in this particular uh, system, we are integrating the springs that I was showing before. So uh, there is no energy consumption in the system uh, apart from the energy for, for the sensors, which is uh, really low. So this is a system that can be operated both for several hours without any uh, uh, battery pack or, or whatever. So uh, this uh, system has been built on research uh, since uh, uh, already uh, or, or conducted for, for a number of years. So basically, these are different pictures of uh, what you have here. Um, it is a uh, six degree of freedom uh, exoskeleton, so we have two ankles, two knees, and two hips. This is the uh, control electronics uh, pack that is uh, right now in this uh, prototype in a backpack, but uh, we have already developed a system that uh, is without a backpack, well, so all the electronics is already are already integrated in, in, the, in the exo. And this is just uh, a user interface to start and stop the system and to change the velocity and the, the walking speed. So uh, I will quickly uh, go through the different technical details of the system. So basically, um, we have a MATLAB system and a simulating system, so we are able to, uh, to set up all our control strategies in these in this, uh, two environments, and then we download these control strategies to the real-time uh, controller that, are, that is implemented in the, in the system. And, uh, and then it can uh, work for, for hours. So uh, this is just an example of uh, how the system can be operated. Uh, this is uh, information that we get uh, from, uh, from a stroke patient, for instance. A stroke patient uh, will have one of the parts of the body uh, paralyzed to paretic. So you can see this in the gate pattern. This is the knee trajectory uh, for uh, for the healthy part of the of the stroke patient, and then this knee trajectory is used by the exoskeleton to provide assistance to the other affected side of the of the of the system. Several details of uh, the technologies that we are using: we are using DC motors together with harmonic drive uh, transmissions at the different uh, uh, joints of the exoskeleton. Again, we have. Uh, uh, the sensors integrated in the different in the different uh, joints. This is just a video of uh, Magdo uh, in our in our labs working with uh, with the exoskeleton. He's using uh, this uh, user interface that is uh, programmed in this uh, uh, mobile phone to uh, start the system to change the speed of the of the system. You will see now how it is uh, being changed. Now he's uh, just uh, changing the walking speed, and you you see now that it's much more slow, uh, much more slower at this at this uh, at this point. He's speeding up again the the operation of the system. This is another video, but I will skip this. 
uh, and go directly to the to the other videos because uh, uh, maybe they are more informative for you. So uh, so far, the presentation of the of the exoskeleton, we combine this ex this technology with other technologies, as I said before. In particular, we combine it uh, with functional electrical stimulation, and this is a setup where we have both systems. So, so we have the exoskeleton that you see here, the structure here, and then you see a number of electrodes uh, in different muscles. So uh, this is an application where we combine both technologies, so we assist uh, the patients either with the exoskeleton or with the functional sti uh, stimulation system uh, based or, or depending on the, le the muscle fatigue, the level of the muscle fatigue that is being developed uh, while walking, okay? Uh, I will skip this. Uh, this is just uh, the example that you you saw before. This is uh, in a hospital uh, uh, training lab. Uh, so uh, the user is uh, has a low level spinal cord injury. So he has still some uh, control at the hip level, but he has lost uh, control at the knee and ankle levels. So he's using uh, this walker here just for stability and to keep balance and the system is uh, either by means of uh, the exoskeleton or by means of the electrodes that are placed mostly in these muscles here uh, assisting uh, this patient while walking uh, during one of the training uh, sessions okay we have been testing the system uh, uh, with uh, with a number of uh, patients in different in different hospitals, uh, again this uh, this is at the same uh, hospital in Spain in Toledo. This at the hospital for paraplegics, and this is again a training session at the at the gym with a combination of the exoskeleton and the functional electrical stimulation system. The, uh, this lady here is the physiotherapist that would uh, implement the manual therapy in case this is not a robotized uh, therapy. Now uh, she is just uh, supporting the the patient. He uh, he's using the walker again for stability and for uh, for keeping uh, balance, and uh, the system is monitoring uh, the EMG activity, so the muscle activity. Of the of the user, he is looking at the level of uh, muscle fatigue that uh, is being developed while walking, and then uh, it is switching from fast uh, from functional electrical stimulation to exoskeletal and back, depending on that uh, on that uh, uh, functional activity. Okay, so with this, uh, I will uh, finish my my presentation. I will thank you for for your attention. This is just a picture of us some of the guys that have been uh, involved in the developments of the different technologies that we, that we, were, present, that we were presenting here. Uh, as I said before, this is the result of a number of uh, European and national school projects. In particular, uh, there was a European project that was called BETTER, uh, in which uh, all these institutions uh, were involved uh, that resulted in the previous version of the exoskeleton that you are uh, that you will see uh, today. And then there is uh, this hyper project that was already introduced uh, and presented by Alessandro de Mauro this morning, uh, and uh, which integrates all these institu institutions uh, in the development of, uh, of these technologies. Just uh, for, for promotional <laughs> For promotional purposes, we or every year we organize a, a summer school on neurorehabilitation where we have people coming from uh, different countries and uh, talking about all the technologies that are being used in the field of uh, neurorehabilitation. So we have people working on uh, 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 speaking about, for instance, brain to computer, brain computer interfaces or EMG technologies, exoskeletons, functional electrical stimulation, and so forth. So uh, with this, I finish the presentation. Uh, now Magda will uh, show the system. He will work uh, in this small corridor here. That you are invited to ask any questions, and we will take them uh, while he is demonstrating the system.
So uh, what you see now here is uh, the exoskeleton that I was talking about uh, during my presentation. So uh, you have the six uh, degrees of freedom. There is a pre-programmed gate pattern that is being uh, f co corresponding to gate uh, to one gate cycle that is being uh, repeated. So you, you, you can uh, can you come here to the to the stage? So ideally, this would be used in combination with other technologies. Now we have only the system that will apply and will uh, force to the to mark those limbs. So uh, now the system is driving uh, the, uh, his uh, his legs. Ideally, we'll have, uh, for instance, a brain computer interface that will be used to detect the intention of uh, of the user uh, to start, for instance, uh, motion or to change uh, uh, gate speed. Or we can use, uh, in combination with this, the electrodes both for stimulation and for recording EMG activity. If we use uh, the, the electrodes for uh, recording EMG activity, we will estimate uh, the level of fatigue of the muscles, and then we will uh, use uh, either the exoskeleton or functional electric stimulation system. So the idea is that uh, with the combination of both systems, we uh, just assist uh, uh, the user as needed. Okay, so thank you very much. If you have any question. Hi, thanks for the talk. I uh, just want to ask a question. What's the production cost of a unit like this, of a typical unit? So uh, this is the result of uh, several European and uh, national school projects. Yeah. If we uh, had to calculate uh, I mean the resources that we put to, the, to develop uh, this, the cost would be several millions of euros because sure. there, there were... Uh, Research uh, costs. So. Yeah. Uh, we transferred this technology to a Spanish company and uh, they are commercializing the system. They have uh, did something very recent. Uh, I think they have already uh, sold a couple of units uh, to the States, to Houston and to, and to no, one to Houston and one to Monterey. And I think the, uh, they sold it to, uh, for 50,000 euros. Per unit. Okay, that's not bad. And uh, I know in America they've got military solutions which are similar yeah. as in robot exoskeletons. Are these comparable in terms no. of technology level? So this this was something that was from the very beginning uh, developed for for rehabilitation. In fact, it was developed uh, the, the one that you are that you are looking at now. It was developed only for rehabilitation. So the idea is to use it this always in the clinical setting. It is not even uh, thought to be used uh, outside, in okay. outdoors, okay? So uh, this is why it is uh, uh, with this cord here, because it is planned for a, for a, yeah, for a clinical setting. Um, so in terms of uh, specifications, uh, capabilities of uh, military exoskeletons and this one, uh, they are completely different. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I would like to ask you, um, uh, well, as you said, I think that you told us that uh, it's supposed to have like a sensor where you record mm -hmm. information and that you will use also for sense stimulation. Um, where do you exactly uh, locate those those sensors in the sections of the muscle, or where you have more fibers, or so so there, there are two, two different types of sensors. Uh, there are some sensors that are integrated in the structure. So we have, uh, yeah, you see this uh, black uh, part here. This is the force sensor. So this is measuring the, the interaction, the force of interaction between uh, this part of the exoskeleton and uh, Magdo uh, hip. Uh, we have the same for the different joints. 
uh, and then we have uh, position sensors and uh, velocity sensors. So these are on board. These uh, these uh, these are uh, integrated in the structure. So in addition to this, you could use, uh, for instance, sensors for uh, sensors for measuring the muscle activity. Then you will place those sensors on the muscle belly. So uh, th th this will be just electrodes that you will stick on, on the muscle belly, and then you will record uh, EMG activity in this particular case for the, for the subject. And you will place those uh, sensors uh, in those muscles that are for interest, uh, of interest for you. And you could use, for instance, a brain uh, computer interface in which you will use a EEG cap and then uh, you can connect that cap, for instance, to the electronics and use that information. For instance, uh, uh, the, the brain activity that is rated to, uh, to, to, to use the intention to move, to drive and to trigger the, the exoskeleton. So, but, but, but you can, you can uh, customize the, the, the type and the number of sensors that you, will, that you would use for a particular patient. And, um are you able also to customize for each patient uh, the range of movement? I mean, because I don't know uh, really, but I guess that depending on the pathology or, or yeah. wh whatever, uh, maybe at the beginning they are not able to get such a big ra range of movement as later. Or yeah, so, so th there are several ways of doing that. So uh, there are physical limits to the range of movement uh, in the exoskeleton. So uh, and these are, uh, are according to the phys physiological limits uh, in our body. For, so for instance, you cannot drive the, the exoskeleton in hyperextension. So you, can, you cannot bend the, the ankle the other way around, the other way. Uh, and this, uh, this is, uh, these are limits that are fixed at the, at the, at the level of the structure. And then uh, in, the, in, the so, uh, in the control software, you can, of course, uh, limit the range of motion for a particular patient uh, according to the, to the condition. Uh, as you said, uh, one of the, one of the um, therapies that, uh, for instance, uh, people with stroke will be subject to is, uh, increase, is a therapy to increase the range of motion. So uh, you can integrate that in the controller of, uh, of the system like this. <laughs> Sorry, and um, um, for example, the first time that uh, you have to use it with a patient, um, how, well, they are probably they are not able to to move it. So, how you get the first range of movement? Uh, do you make a movement with them, doing like a passive? Um, so, so that yeah. So uh, I will very briefly, briefly explain how the system is set up for a particular patient. So f first you take several uh, uh, body landmarks and then you get some uh, anthropometric details of the, of the user. Then you use these bars here at the, are telescopic bars so you can adapt the, the, the length of the bars according to the size and, and the height of the, of the person. So you adapt the exoskeleton physically to the to the person, then uh, we have several ways of uh, controlling the system. One of the ways is what we call systems needed. Uh, so in this, in this particular uh, strategy, what we have is an ideal uh, gait pattern. So we monitor the activity of the patient and we assist for each of the joints, uh, the patient up, uh, up to reaching this ideal pattern that is taken from a healthy person. So uh, as far as the, uh, or as long as the, as the user uh, gets rehabilitated, so he will gain uh, force, range of motion, and so forth. So the, the strategy will adapt also to these conditions and will apply uh, less force because it is needed uh, less force to, 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 uh, to keep walking. And this is done automatically uh, by, the, by the control software. But we can also use other strategies. So we, can, we could, for instance, use a resistive uh, strategy where you impede the, the motion uh, of, the, of a particular joint.
¿Quieres contestar todo uno? Hello. Hello. What's the amount of data and knowledge used in this project? The amount of data and knowledge for, for uh, developing this technology. Yes. yes. So there, there is a big, big deal of uh, work on biomechanics. So uh, everything related to the design of the structure, the design of the kinematics of the joints, uh, the design of uh, the actuators, the, the power that, uh, that, are, that is required for the actuators, the selection of sensors, this is based on uh, biomechanical um, knowledge that, uh, that has been developed uh, along, the along the years. Um, Of course, everything related to uh, to mechanics, uh, mechanical engineering for uh, for building the system, integrating the systems, uh, uh, the, the, the structure together with the exoskeleton, with the actuators, electronics, and so forth, is also a big part of the of the project. Um, everything related to um, to uh, theories for uh, for rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation. Uh, is is uh, is very important because uh, this will lead this will uh, guide us uh, or, or uh, th this will help us to to select w which are the, st the control strategies that uh, we will implement in the in the structure in the in the control structure of the system. So th there are mo there are many uh, disciplines and uh, fields that are involved in uh, in a project like this. Of course, uh, this has to be. Uh, the requirements to develop uh, such a system are typically um, uh, developed by neuro neurologists and uh, people that are working uh, in the clinical practice with uh, with this uh, with this, with these patients. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a lot of uh, disciplines that are involved in in this. If uh, we consider the operation of the system uh, and the and the amount of data that we need to, uh, for instance, make the system work. So it is not that much. I mean, uh, so the, the the information that is coming from the different sensors that you see in the in the structure is really uh, reduced. Uh, the things get uh, complex when you start using, for instance, a, a brain computer interface, because then you are monitoring uh, several uh, brain activity at uh, different uh, locations, at different uh, frequencies or if you are using EMG uh, activity, and depending of course on the, no uh, on the number of, uh, of EMG sensors that you use. But it, so uh, f for the basic operation that you saw here, it is just a reduced amount of, uh, of data. If in the clinical practice, it could be uh, much higher. Huh? Can you get a round of applause please for Magdo? And Jose, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, the next session will be at 8 o'clock. will be Mary Kay Byrne on how technology has influenced us to make astronomical changes. Thank you very much.